Good morning, everybody. All right, we're, we're caffeinated enough, thank you. <laughs> so um, it's my pleasure to, to briefly introduce the panel and take about a minute or two to frame out quickly some of the uh, very challenging issues that we want to talk about this morning and seed for future G7 and other conversations. The economic security of families and communities all across the world um, have never rested as heavily on women as they do today. And that raises, uh, for, for this panel, uh, some really s deep and profound questions around uh, not just what economic security is, uh, but around the role of women, um, around the role of economic growth and prosperity and how that is shared or not shared, and of course, uh, the profound issues around social exclusion. Uh, we want to flip that and talk about inclusion today, of course, uh, especially um, how growth is distributed in, in, in relationship to social exclusion um, with the basis of race, gender, ethnicity, uh, capacity, uh, religion, and others. 50 minutes can't take us all there this morning. Uh, but we do have, um, I think, an incredible panel. And let me just introduce them briefly. The full bios are, are of course, in, in the program. So Gabriela Ramos, who is Chief of Staff and Sherpa OECD, uh, and she will lead us off in a moment. Um, Augusto Lopez Claros, a currently senior scholar at, at Georgetown University. Uh, Carolyn Wilkins, a senior deputy governor, Bank of Canada, and Dagmar Freitag, uh, member of parliament uh, in, in Germany. So uh, the design quickly is we're going to divide us into a couple of questions. The first question is, uh, and I want panelists to take just a few moments because we're going to dive deeper into a second round of questions. So I want to ask people first, and I'm going to start with Gabriela, um, from, tell us a little bit about your work and identify two of the most important challenges for prosperity and inclusion that you see. Uh, thank you, Tom, and good morning, everybody. Great to be in this fantastic panel. Um, I'm actually the Sherpa to the uh, G20, and I work with the G7, with, uh, with your uh, colleagues here leading uh, to the summit. But I also lead the initiative on inclusive growth at the OECD. And I have to say that uh, even before the crisis, we have been documenting, and of course, along with the World Bank, IMF, many other institutions, uh, the increased inequalities of income, opportunities, and outcomes in our societies. And we're talking about the OECD countries. We're not talking about the Sustainable Development Goals. We're not talking about the very, very poor regions in the world. We're talking about countries that have already developed their social safety nets. And what we see is that out of uh, uh, globalization, out of uh, uh, putting so much emphasis in efficiency, we have the bottom 40% that have not benefited from growth prospects and from the growth dispatchment that we have even before the crisis. The most complicated issue of all these is that inequalities are compounding, building up disadvantages for the bottom of the for, for the bottom 40% of our populations, almost half of the population. What does it mean? You live in, in a low-income family, you will receive probably low-quality education and reach lower levels of education. You will probably have less access to health and have lower, lower life expectancy, and we have documented that. If you are a children whose parents have not reached secondary education, you have 15 chance, percent chances of reaching that level compared to 65% of all the other children. You have seven years less of life expectancy. I mean, all these things are just compounding to create a situation, and the most uh, uh, difficult task now is that the political economy and the political uh, outcomes of these inequalities is creating an explosive situation. The political economy of advancing solutions to these questions is not uh, moving as it should, and I think we need to take a hard look. Wealth is worst. If you think that income is uh, skewedly distributed, let me tell you that top, the top 10% of the, uh, the income groups keep half of wealth, and the top 1% keep 20% of wealth, while 40% just keeps 3% of wealth. So this is really creating this animosity, societies that are fractured, and political outcomes that are really divisive 
the increase of protectionism and the increase of uh, populism. So I think we really need to take a hard look and I commend uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, we met with him when he was in Paris and he asked the OECD to help him have a very meaningful outcome on inclusive growth for the G7. Gender is the other angle, uh, but you have been discussing also because in the low income groups, in the lower of the lower of the bottom, you will always find a woman and you will always find a single mom. And therefore, I think that uh, when we discuss inclusiveness, uh, gender is one angle that we can really make uh, a great progress. Second point, beware of the digital economy, of not opening an additional angle for divisiveness, an additional angle for inequality, because of course we know that the dynamics of the digital transformation requires very high skilled workers, it requires very technological settings, it requires a, a, a lot of adaptability and flexibility, and this is not what you hide in the low, uh, lower income of the bottom distribution. So this is the second question that I would put into the panel. Great, uh, thank you very much. I'm uh, personally quite pleased that we are raising up the, the issue of, of wealth and the way in which um, it is much more unequally distributed. Um, before I, I, I turn to the next, next speaker, just for example, in the United States, a single woman possesses 32 cents for every dollar of a single man. Um, and we look at when that is uh, looked at for Latina women and black women, it's one cent on a dollar. Um, so the robustness of that inequality and wealth um, gives us a whole different magnitude of, of, of issues to think about. Augusto. Um, thank you, Thomas. Um, you know, two or three years ago, a, a former colleague of mine at the IMF um, did a piece in the Financial Times, the title of which was The Golden Age of Growth. And his thesis was basically the following. For the last 20 years, the low-income countries have been growing more rapidly than the high-income countries. Therefore, we have, we have entered a period of convergence. Therefore, let's celebrate. Um, it occurred to me that it would be interesting to address the issue of how long will this process of convergence actually take place? So at the World Bank, with a couple of my, of my uh, uh, research assistants, we did some simulations to try to address this question. And it's a very simple exercise which I want to highlight for you um, very quickly. If you <clears throat> take the high income countries, you notice that the average income per capita is about $41,000 in 2016. The low income countries is about 615. So assume that for the next 20 years or, or the next 50 years, these countries, these two groups of countries grow at roughly the same rate that they have grown for the last 20 years. That means 2.6 for the high income countries, 4.7 for the low income countries. You know what happens with this gap, which at the moment is about $40,000? It widens, it widens for a long, long time because essentially 2.6% of $41,000 is a number that is a lot bigger than 4.7% of 600. In fact, the gap widens and it peaks in the year 2197 and convergence finally comes uh, sometime in the 23rd century, right? This observation has actually been noted before. Uh, Thomas Homer Dixon, who actually teaches at the University of Toronto here, uh, calls it the dirty, little, the dirty little secret of development economics. My concern essentially is that when you have this gap which grows over time, the bigger the gap, the more difficult to make the jump. If I am a father in a sub-Saharan African country who naturally wishes his children to have the same opportunities, the same access to education that uh, children in Germany and Sweden have today, but I am told implicitly that it will take a couple of centuries for me to be able to do that as part of this process of conversions, then I will be motivated by either kind, other kinds of incentives. Then I might want to migrate. If I, am, if I have some bright ideas and I have an entrepreneurial spirit, I may want to take my ideas elsewhere, perhaps in Europe, uh, and therefore contribute in some way to the migration crisis. Um, in other words, other kinds of incentives begin to, begin to kick in, which are, you know, complicate the, the environment for policymakers. This is one of the concerns that I have, that um, 
inequality is not going to be solved simply by waiting for economic growth to pull the low, con the low, the low income countries out of the, the present condition and allow them to catch up. Thank you. So from the central bank point of view, what, what are the issues you're working on? <laughs> <laughs> sure, you may all wonder what does the central bank have to do with issues related to equality because our main ma mandate and what, what I'm responsible for as Senior Deputy Governor is uh, monetary policy and our inflation target of 2%, among other things that we do. And in fact, it may seem really remote uh, to issues related to inclusiveness and, and inequality, but in fact, behind the scenes, achieving that objective is actually setting a really solid foundation to support equality. And if you think about it for a second, it's really intuitive. Um, when you target inflation, what you get is a more stable economy. You get incomes growing uh, at a sustainable rate. It's more stable. You're less likely to get recessions. You still get them, but you get fewer uh, than you had before. And we all know that when a recession hits, it's actually the people who have more fragile uh, employment situations uh, who are less able to sustain that uh, downturn in the economy. And so, you know, there's a lot of research that says in Canada that our inflation targeting regime since the last 25 years has kind of achieved more stable growth, even when you take into account the great financial crisis. It's not just true for Canada, it's true for other countries, G7 countries who have also got some version of that. And so, and so a central bank doesn't have a mandate directly to, to look at uh, um, income inequality, but we don't have the tools either. But what we do to stabilize the macroeconomy actually really helps. And we have a stake in it as well. And I can say that, that uh, because we have a stake, there's a couple of things that worry me. And the first is just that when you have uh, rising inequ inequality, you have kind of a vicious circle that it can install, which is you have more volatile uh, economic growth, you have a more fragile financial system, and again, that, that creates that, that vicious circle. And you know, you mentioned digital, digitalization, I think that um, that is definitely something to watch because there are mechanisms there uh, through, um, you know, People that aren't highly educated may not benefit from that productivity growth. Um, you've got increase in monopoly power, which means that there's less uh, opportunity for entrepreneurs. I think these things are things to watch. And the final thing that worries me is trust. When you don't have social cohesion, um, when it's undermined because people think the system isn't fair, it doesn't include them, then you undermine trust in institutions. And for the Bank of Canada, trust is actually our currency. That's, there's a lot of trust in the Bank of Canada right now, and we, we just can't take that for granted. So, thank you. Uh, Dagmar, from, um, from your point of view in Germany, um, what are some of the challenges that you'd like to lift up today? Yes, thank you very much for the question. Uh, you already mentioned it. I'm a member of parliament of the Social Democratic Party in Germany. And I would say questions um, of inequality and inclusive economy have been, I would say, in the DNA of my party for more than 150 years. But, of course, the challenges have changed dramatically. Um, I think the first and one of the most important points of um, um, that have to be solved in the future is the problem that economic growth is no longer linked to the promise of social advancement. And um, we know, I think you already mentioned it, we have, um, we have the problem that jobs will fall victim to digitalization, for example, to globalization. And that is what we are concerned about in Germany and um, what we discuss, of course, uh, in our parliamentary debates. And from my point of view, an investment in education is the most important thing a society can offer to its young people. Well-educated young people have a chance to get a job at least, in best case, a good job. Um, but of course, we 
in all societies, we have the so-called left behinds. And um, it's not only them, but many of them, who show a loss of trust in the established political parties, not only in Germany, um, but uh, in many countries of the European continent. And um, that might be one of the reasons for the success of populist parties um, in the recent elections. Another pressing concern from my point of view um, is the fact that many problems can no longer be solved just on the national level. Um, there are so many things that have to be solved on the international level. Um, I think everybody knows if we talk about tax regulations, if we talk about um, companies like Amazon, Google, Facebook, whatever, um, and their successful efforts to reduce their taxes. So I think if economic inclusive movement, moments or movements show people we care for them, that it will have an impact on the inclusive society as well. And that is what, from my point of view, uh, the people demand. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much to, to all, all four of you. Um, just, just quickly, um, we have really identified some uh, very profound issues. And, and it seems to me there's a constellation that people talked about. And constellation, and I'm going to use some of the phrases people talked about. Compounding inequality, explosive nature, gap grows, more difficult to progress, we need more stability, um, volatility is increasing, trust is an issue. The solutions are not going to be within one nation. We're talking about global phenomena and global processes. So let's take, let's really now try and lean forward into what some of the solutions or what the path looks like to get us to bend the curve, if you will, away from what I would call the, the headlong progress to toxic inequality. So, Gabriella, um, uh, how are we going to solve toxic inequality? And just in terms of the issues that you wanted to raise up, what puts us on that path? What do we need to do? Well, we have the traditional policies, the distribution policies, social policies that we all know, but that's not the point. I think that, that, that we need to change the narrative because the narrative has always been let's grow first and then we distribute. And we know that doesn't work. I would say let's get away from averages. If we continue measuring progress by GDP and GDP per capita, how would you know how people are faring? We, we, we always said at the OECD we need to have centers people growth. And, and now because you have more granular data, we're looking at household disposable income. We're not looking at GDP per capita. Then you can take a look at how policies are going to have an impact in different income groups. And bring the equity considerations ex ante, because I have to say that we have always been very worried about the efficiency of markets. And equity is always the afterthought. Okay, if it doesn't work on fiscal policy, if it doesn't work on monetary policy, then we fix it through the social policies. I think we really need to change the narrative and we need to go for people-centered work. And this means really bringing the equity considerations where you apply the lenses. As we saw, say, for example, of gender budgeting or gender angles in all the policies that we're doing, we need to go to that granularity to know how much the policies we're gonna advance are gonna help people or not. I'm very concerned because one angle that we have not spoken about is how much inequality of income or uh, economic inequality lead to political inequality, access to decision makers. How much you have a skewed systems when the top of the income distribution has half of wealth and have access to policy decisions that probably skew those decisions and then the political economy gets very complicated, not to talk about financing campaigns, which is a real problem for our democracies and all of these things are linked. So I have to say change the narrative is very important that we include these this, uh, equity lenses ex ante and get away from the averages and don't think that growth is just going to be trickling down and that's what we're gonna uh, be achieving on this, on this question. In terms of multilateral cooperation, I I, I'm glad to tell you that we at the OECD have been working on the base erosion and profit shifting 
in the G20 and in the G7, which means how do we ensure that multinationals pay their fair due on taxes, which is, it, it was a system that tried to avoid uh, uh, double taxation, and we finished with double non-taxation. And now through the BEPS project at the OECD, at least I hope we, we have, you know, we have uh, our member countries in the G20, they have uh, raised 82 billion only for voluntary disclosure of companies that usually will pay 9%, 3% of taxes. This is one of the issues that I would say, let's just go for it. The other issue is how do you focus on opportunities? How do you go, for example, early childcare, but not just in general, to say zero to four, where the brain is being developed, how do I invest in low-income children? Because that's where they will be lying their foundations to advance their learning processes and their possibilities in life. So go very granular, go for things that you know will have high impact. And again, the gender ag agenda. How do we ensure, and this, for example, the, the, the um, um, uh, childcare facilities, is a, it's a, it's a win-win situation because then you will be helping particularly low-income women to have a place where their children will receive high quality education. And I have to say, in all the OECD countries, we don't know what happened in the early child care education services. We don't even know how we recruit the services. We don't know how do we bring about the progress that we have made in the research of child development into those areas. I think there are there's lots to do in there. And then the business dynamics. Let's ju let me just finish by that. We always say productivity is stagnant in all the OECD countries. Well, no. Productivity for frontier firms that are really taking advantage of the digital economy is 5% in the service sector and 3% in the manufacturing. Lager firms, zero. So you have this breakdown of the technological diffusion machine. And that's another angle. How do we enhance the business dynamics that will allow the, all, all the SMEs and all the uh, uh, small companies to take advantage, as I said, of the digital revolution. Thank you. Uh, Augusto, so you, you've laid out a, um, a scenario that we're trying to get away from <laughs> in terms of, of what future growth might look like if the path doesn't change. Um, what's needed to change that path and how, where do we start? Just a little question. <laughs> um, there are things that are already being done. I would, I would consider this sort of traditional recipes to address income inequality. I'd like to spend one minute on that. And then, and then I'd like to go into something that I call non-traditional approaches to income inequality, things that we, we, we need to do and that, that we could leverage to, to make uh, progress in addressing this, this problem. Um, on, the, on the traditional side, you know, we can, for instance, improve the targeting of benefits and, and improve our social safety nets. Uh, that's a particular challenge in the developing countries because they don't have typically the administrative capacity to do a good targeting of, of benefits to address questions of inequality. Um, we could uh, improve the equity in the tax system and some of that is being done in, 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 in many parts of the world. Um, we could look at issues of the labor market and labor market policies. Many countries have unusually rigid labor legislation which contributes to informality, it contributes to tax evasion. Very often the motivation of these rigid labor laws is, is a good, is, is to protect the workers, but very often they are counterproductive in their, in their effects and, and they tend to worsen income inequality. There are questions of financial inclusion as well, which, which we, could, we could do more of, and of course addressing issues of corruption. However, let me enter into what I call the non-traditional aspect. And I will begin by giving you an example. Um, there was a study done at the International Monetary Fund in 2015, which looked at the, the cost of energy subsidies. Um, we are spending on a, on a global scale, according to the IMF, $5.3 trillion um, in subsidizing gasoline, natural gas, electricity, carbon. This is about 6.5% of global GMP. Now, what does this have to do with inequality? It turns out that 60% of the benefits of, for instance, the gasoline subsidy goes to the 20% 20, 20 top of the income distribution. In a country like India, who are the recipients of the gasoline subsidies? It's not the poor uh, Indian uh, uh, women villagers uh, you know, out in the outs outskirts of, of Delhi. No, it is basically the, 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 the people who own cars. It's the public officials and the members of the private sector who basically 
um, are in the upper income uh, groups. So th these policies are very regressive in nature. The IMF study says that if subsidies were eliminated on a global scale, it actually reduce uh, emissions of carbon dioxide by 20%. It would be uh, an immeasurable contribution to redressing the impact of climate change. So in thinking about inequality, it's really difficult for me to come up with a worse public policy than subsidizing energy. So that's one thing that we can do. Secondly, and, and this addresses the question of gender, uh, at the World Bank, for the last decade or so, we have been compiling a fascinating database that looks at the restrictions that countries are in, imposing on women embedded in the law, through the constitution, the civil code, family law, a number of large legal instruments. And so from this database, we can tell you, for instance, what are the 25 restrictions we, that we have discovered in the law in Iran, uh, to give you an example, which is a country that has, is, is particularly heavy-handed in, in, in the way that it treats women. Now, the advantage of this data set is that we begin to correlate the number of restrictions with a lot of interesting other pieces of information. And for instance, we know that the higher the number of restrictions embedded in the law, the lower the labor force participation rates of women. The higher the number of restrictions, the lower the number of women-owned businesses in these countries. And we're covering 190 countries, by the way, the whole world. The larger the number of restrictions, the lower the school enrollment rate of girls relative to boys. In other words, the restrictions embedded in the law are having already a discouraging effect in terms of girls who are thinking and saying, well, what's the point of studying if my mother is not going to be able to access the job market? Russia uh, is one of 100 countries where, in the law, there are 456 jobs, 456 occupations which, which are forbidden to women. Not surprisingly, this leads to a huge wage gap between men and women. So this whole area of eliminating those, those uh, restrictions in the law, which basically undermine women's property rights, prevent her from accessing the job market, um, uh, create all kinds of discriminations against her, against her is, I think, one of the areas in which we need to do a great deal more. Because we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of restrictions. Only 10% of the countries in the world have legislation that is gender neutral. 90% of the countries in the world have restrictions. Sometimes 10, 15, 20, 25, it's, it's not unusual. So this is one area in which we could do a great deal. Because this database also shows that those countries that um, provide incentives for women to join the labor market and are countries that on average have lower Gini coefficients, in other words, lower levels of inequality. So this is a vast area in which organizations such as the Women's Forum you know, could become advocates to, 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 to press countries you know, to do more in this area. And then finally, um, we have also discovered at the World Bank that countries that have a better business environment that encourages entrepreneurship, that eliminates needless burdensome regulation and red tape are countries that also tend to have better levels of, of inequality because it encourages entrepreneurship, because people will stay in the country instead of uh, taking their good ideas and, 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 their, and their talents you know, to Germany or North America or whatever it is else that they go. Thank you, Augusto. I, I, I'm, I know there's a lot of wisdom there, and, and maybe we can get into those conversations further. Um, Carolyn, so raising the issues um, about the, the path we're on leading to greater volatility and uh, trust becomes an issue about who the, the governed and, and who is doing the governing. Um, what, in your estimate, um, not as a central banker, <laughs> But what, what, do we, what do we need to do to disrupt the path that, that, you, that we seem to be on? So, so as an economist, I'll take my central banker hat off, but it's almost impossible for me to take my economist hat off. It just is stuck there. Um, it, it seems to me that, that um, the path we're on when it's coming to technological progress, it's coming to uh, digitalization, all those forces at play are really positive from a point of view of overall growth. And, and, so, and so that needs to be kept firmly in mind. I think to change the narrative of the trust is for people, not just people in this room, but actually people who are not like us, who aren't in this room, to see what's in it for them. 
and see how they're going to be ma able to manage manage that change. And for that to happen, policy making has to has to be more expansive in terms of um, what it looks at, what it cares about when it makes choices. And so, and so um, I think that's first and foremost. And so, you know, we talk about trade and how it's good for good for everyone and a rising tide lifts all boats. But if you look at the economic research, we know that's actually not true. A lot of people end up getting left behind. A lot of the people are women, lower parts of the income distribution, and they tend to be concentrated in particular cities. And so you have whole communities that are kind of left with not a lot and wondering oh, how could this have been good. And so, and, and I don't think that sounds really depressing, but in fact, I don't think it, it, it's an impossible task. I think there are ways and, and governments are working on ways when they do their policy analysis to include in their trade-offs the implications for the distribution of income. And if you put that right up front, then you can go, well, what can we do to mitigate this? And yes, a lot of obvious suspects come on the table, like education, education in STEM. Um, but I think we need to be uh, very imaginative and, and more modern to, to fit those things to, to the uh, current situation, to the, to the modern economy. And I'm a central banker, and so I'm not the best person to give you advice on that. All I can say is, um, from my own uh, point of view, when we try to hire, uh, I can see that there is a, a dearth of women who are actually interested in economics at the graduate level. And so, and so um, we need to, we've been trying for years to figure out how to get more women into the bank. We're actually doing pretty well. We have 50% of our, our uh, employees, if we have um, 1,700 employees in total, half of them are women, so that's actually pretty good. Uh, if you look at the economics and finance side, it's a bit less, and so, so I guess my observation is that that education system needs to uh, really find ways to uh, include as many diverse parts of the population as possible in these STEM areas, and and I guess and I guess um, finally, we talk a lot about how to get. I mean, the last the last set of discussions I could hear from the other side of the curtain, <laughs> we're talking about well, how do you get more senior women? How do you get more decision makers? And that's a real, that's a real uh, challenge uh, for, for institutions that don't have a lot of people in the pipeline to, to be able to feed that who are different. But it's just so important. And I think real change comes when you have a diverse set of people around the table. Because that's when you get diverse sets of ideas of what we should care about. And, and you see that in the research. You see that boards with which are more diverse have um, well, actually better performance, and so it it's actually pays off. Um, but you also can see that you avoid falling into that echo chamber. And in central banking, uh, you can say, well, how much diversity of thought can you can you have? Uh, um, it's just economics. It's it's pretty boring. Uh, and I would say actually that's exactly the opposite. In fact, this is exactly the right time uh, where we're doing projects where we actually require that diversity of thought, whether we're thinking about digitalization, whether we're thinking about crypto assets, what the new economy is going to look like. Um, we need that diversity. And so, you know, maybe later we can talk a little bit about how, how do you get that. We've got some ideas at the bank that we're trying, but I think those two things, uh, you know, including uh, diversity in your, in your policy making decisions, including uh, gender-based analysis, analysis that says what does this do for the distribution of income, and having a diverse set of decision makers could, could actually end up over time putting us in a better place. Mm. So thank you, oh. Dagmar. Um, I, I'm thinking about um, a couple of links, a couple of connections that either have been really broken empirically or that people feel have been broken. Uh, one link that is broken is the link uh, from merit and achievement to reward. And another link that seems to be broken is the, the vast amount of, of GDP growth at a, at a macro level and how that, uh, the lack of distribution of that. And, and, and as we're seeing in many countries, um, historic highs in both wealth and income inequality. 
And it seems to me that a number, because I think we've raised this issue on that side of the panel, um, there seems to be a, a perceived sense of some groups that they're tumbling down the status hierarchy, which has given rise to uh, so-called populist movements in, in, in many countries. Um, I'm wondering if you could lead us in that direction and talk about where we need to go. Yes, I will try at least. <laughs> uh, let, me, let me again have a look at the international level. I already pointed out that we in the European Union, for example, witness more or less every day how extremely complicated it is to counter tax avoidance hmm. strategies of the companies which I already mentioned, but they are just examples. So um, this is something that, that makes people who pay their taxes month by month, um, makes them lose the trust into the democratic standards of their countries. Um, they ask me, why don't you do anything against that? And I only can say, yes, we do our very best to find a solution on the international level. That means on the, Europe on the level of the European Union. But of course, that's not that easy, because we have to find anonymous um, votings for, for many, many things. So it's a hard struggle, and it is not won yet. Um, the other thing on the international level is from my point of view, and we haven't talked about that uh, this morning so far, I think we have to think about our development, cooperation and strategies concerning countries on the African continent, for example. Um, I think we need a cohesive approach to that. Um, there are critical subsidies which, as a consequence, frustrate efforts uh, to build up sustainable um, agricultural sectors on the African continent. This is a contradiction. On the one hand, we spend money in order to support them, and on the other hand, our own efforts are destroyed by that. So I think that that can't be the solution, and we have to talk about uh, these problems on the international level. It's not a question of national decisions. And um, yes, I think maybe the Western, Western societies, Western countries have to be more self-critical in some way. Um, if we are, or if we will not be successful to cope with the challenges on the international level, we have a kind of bash backlash someday. Um, it might, as a consequence, be uh, that more and more migrants will try to reach the European con uh, continent. And especially um, we in Germany are just facing huge challenges in terms of integrating people who have come into our country two years ago. And um, honestly, we haven't solved the problem so far. Um, at the domestic level, of course, Germany has had um, or has established a pretty successful form of economy. We call it social market economy. And it has been quite successful over the past years. Um, but of course, we, we are facing the, the problems and the challenges of the future. And um, we have to adapt new solutions and have to integrate them into our social market economy. And of course, we have a um, remarkable gender equality gap in Germany. Um, compared, for example, to other OECD countries. And um, yes, still we have a pay gap. Women uh, generally earn less money, even if they are as well educated as men. And um, 
To be honest, when I started working as a politician around about uh, 20 years ago, I would not have expected to talk, to have to talk about this topic in the 21st century still. Um, but anyway, I think we have to. In Germany, we, we also face um, a comparable low share of female CEOs in the top level companies. Um, we talk about quotas, but um, it, it does not really work properly. Uh, on the political field, in, in regards to the coming decisions of the new government in Germany, um, we, we have agreements to, um, to improve, for example, better daycare, to improve the conditions for single parents that, you know, normally it's women who are single parents and uh, we, we want to support them uh, that they have a better chance to get back to the job and not only to a part-time job but also to a full-time job. I think this is one step uh, to, to help them to make their way in the inclusive economy. Um, one other point. I already mentioned it, is uh, integration of migrants. It seems to be especially in, in Germany still a problem. Um, the reason for that might be that for, for many, many years we had a very conservative approach to the issue of migration. We had people from other countries, from the Turkey, from Italy, from Spain, who came to Germany. They were supposed to leave after some years, but they didn't, they stayed. But there was no solution for real integration and the consequences of this false approach um, is today's problem in Germany. Um, that means we have to invest a huge amount of money, especially in the education of people who come to our country, and this is the same for other countries all over the world, you have to learn and speak the language in the country where you want to live. Otherwise, you will not have the chance to have a self-determined life one day. So investments in education in general, but especially, of course, in, in those people who more or less are at the bottom third of the society, are investments in a good future of the society. Okay, maybe th it's th thank you. for the moment. The, the challenges are obviously steep, um, but we've known the challenges for decades. And as we've pointed out, there are um, a whole host of really good ideas. There's a whole host of proven concepts to work on. Uh, so maybe the issue is, uh, is about narrative, is about power is about who gets to make those decisions. So let me, I, I want to broaden the conversation as much as the time will allow us now. Um, we have an honored first commentator, Maya Roy, who's the CEO of uh, YWCA and is on the, the Gender Equality Advisory Council. So Maya, if you would take the first crack and tell us a little bit about what you're hearing from the panel and how that resonates with the work on the council. Good morning. I, I appreciate the, the opportunity to, to comment. Um, I'm wearing two hats today. So as CEO of YWCA, Canada's largest women's organization, our job is to put these solutions in, into practice. So I really appreciate the panel's comments, for example. Oh. Um, I appreciate the panel's comments, for example, on toxic inequality. <laughs> We're certainly seeing that, but I'm also wearing the hat of the co-chair of the working group for the future of jobs with the G7 Gender Equality Advisory Council, um, which I'm co-chairing with the, the esteemed Malala Yousafzai. Um, what I wanted to very quickly comment on is as, as a frontline service provider, as an NGO, certainly we have seen exactly the impact of what you were talking about. So the impact of digitalization as, as the economy has transitioned from manufacturing leaving North America to a more service-based economy, we know that digitalization 
automation isn't always the panacea that it's meant to be. Um, it has contributed to a more politically volatile environment. So for example, when we have our cousins to the south where the political leadership is making policy via Twitter, and you have, you have a volatile environment, we're seeing in Canada an increase of asylum seekers, of your most vulnerable. Uh, asylum seekers who are of Haitian descent, who are experiencing anti-black racism in the States. And so we are now seeing them as asylum seekers here in Canada and looking at how we can provide supports to the impact of immigration. We also know when it comes to digitalization and automation and the impact of jobs that unfortunately computers also reflect the biases of their human of their human masters. So for example, research in Stanford um, have identified that algorithms can actually be sexist. So there, when, when they tested a number of job search um, algorithms, the, the algorithms were spitting out Caucasian male resumes. So the gender bias was implicitly programmed in. We've also seen research where algorithms, for example, uh, a number of, of service providers in the states where child protective services were actually targeting Latina and black African American families to have their children taken away. Purely, this is a computer, right? So when coders and Silicon Valley firms talk about the concept of garbage in, garbage out, um, that lens that we use, so I very much appreciate my colleagues' um, discussion of uh, using a gender lens and the whole notion of toxic inequality, because if we have intersectional problems, we need intersectional solutions. So what does that look like? So I'm very gonna quickly give you two examples, and again, they're not perfect, they're not panaceas, but where there's, I've met some incredible people over the last two days, and part of, part of our role at the Gender Equality Advisory Council is what kind of solutions are we taking back? Um, so when a policy is put in place, who benefits? Right, that's the first question to ask. And as you Absolutely. pointed out, who's in the room and who's not in the room? And why are they not in the room? What's stopping them from being there, right? So one of the things um, a number of state governments in Brazil have done is they have instituted participatory budgeting. They have allocated percentages of municipal and state uh, budgets that where there's an ongoing consultation and policymaking process and a number of government institutions here in Canada have actually adopted that participatory budgeting making process. So really getting down to with laser like precision, community members who are the most vulnerable um, actually able to allocate based on um, what's happening in their community. So for example, we have public housing where predominantly it's women, it's racialized women, it's low-income community members actually deciding what are you going to make a decision around when you have asbestos in your home, right? When you have a community that, that's crumbling. So the skills and the resilience and the strength is there. So that's one. Uh, the second one is also looking at, uh, I'm very proud of a program we have here in Canada. It's, it's nationally funded, and this is where state investment is really important. It's called Language Instruction for Newcomers to Canada, or LINK. And basically what this is, is right across the country, if a newcomer woman comes to Canada, she can access free English as a second language or French as a second language classes with, important, with childcare included. And I've seen the impact that that has. There's, um, when my colleague was talking about the importance of integration or social inclusion, as, as I like to call it, there's a real power when you have a newcomer woman come, be with a community of her peers, learn English or French in a really safe environment, go down at lunch and have lunch with your, with your kids, with your children, with your preschoolers or your toddlers, and they're also learning the language, they're also getting to know the culture. And then you're having labor market access, programming, employment counseling, job search skills, employer job fair searches actually built in. So again, that pathway, that distance from the labor market is actually shortened. So at the Gender Equality Advisory Council for the, for the G7, one of the things we've been exploring is what kind of investments need to be made if we have these kind of gendered, gender responsive, integrated packages of education, labor market access, because we know it's not just one thing, 
it's, it's all of the solutions coming together to be able to unlock that 12 trillion to 28 trillion dollars, that potential that we have as, as women and girls. Um, because just because we're in school doesn't mean we're actually learning, right? So we have been funded, for example, at the YWCA, um, a six month course uh, to do mobile app development programming. Great, right? We're talking about women in STEM. They come, they do a nine month program, learn how to become a developer and start um, d programming mobile apps. But what if, what if you have an abusive partner? What if you don't have money for the bus tickets to get to the program? What if you're experiencing trauma? So all of those supports need to be built in. So thank you very much for your comments and thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you, thank you. So, unfortunately, we've run out of time. The, the challenges have not run out on us, and we've not solved them. Um, but let me take a moderator's prerogative and take just 22 seconds um, to, to sum up where, where I, I think some of the solutions are leading us. I, 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 I love Maya's uh, comment there about what is needed, um, in my rephrasing, is an intersectional equity filter that looks at who's making policy and the distributional impact of policy that allows us to know, at least in the policy conversations, where a particular institutional dynamic or regulation or policy will lead us, and we have an idea also about what the distributional impact of that is. So I would like to, to thank the panel um, greatly for the participation and I'm, I'm just personally sorry that we didn't have a whole lot more time because I wanted to hear more from each of them. So a round of applause please. Thank you very